I don't serve the Lord out of fear or I don't serve the Lord out of obligation. But I tell you this, when I really understand how, how magnificently terrible my sins are and what Jesus did for me, if I worked for Jesus for the rest of my life and never got a dime, it'd be a good deal. Okay, we're in 1 Samuel 15 this morning. <clears throat> 1 Samuel 15. And we're going to look at verses 24 through 35 today. I want to talk to you a little bit about this issue of repentance. When we talk about um, we're sorry or people say that they're sorry, uh, what does that really look like? What does real repentance look like? Because they're, you know, um, you hear this term a lot, don't you? But I said I was sorry. You know, I think sometimes we think that just by saying that we're sorry, then we're free from um, whatever we've done. And, and so we kind of use that sometimes as an excuse. What we're going to look at today is a man in Saul who said he was sorry, but wasn't really repentant. And there, is a, there is a big difference between, and, and there, is a, uh, there is a certain way that repentance looks. So this is a pretty gory story. There's really no way around this. You know, one of the things that when you just preach through the Bible, you can't skip over stuff. So you can't say, well, um, I'm not going to talk about that today because it's kind of gory. So, I, so when you kind of commit to preaching through the Bible, then you have to deal with this stuff. So I, w- I would be totally honest with you. I would probably skip over this story <laughs> if I wasn't just preaching through the Bible. But it's here for a reason, and God's trying to teach us a truth here. And, and so I think that the great the truth that he has for Topeka Baptist this morning is it, it, it really raises up, this is Saul, and this is what a non-repentant person looks like. We're all going to make mistakes. Everybody in the room is going to make mistakes. Uh, there's nobody here that's perfect, and there's nobody free of sin. Uh, the issue is not the fact that we're not going to make mistakes. The issue is how do we respond to our sin? That's really what the Bible cares about. How do we respond to our sin? Do we respond in a repentant way? And, or do, do, we, do we try to make things right, or do we just kind of go on stubbornly in our sin? Well, Saul was one who kind of went on stubbornly in his sin. You know, there, the next king is a guy named David, and David, I would argue that David made more horrific mistakes than Saul did. I mean, David did some horrible things. I mean, David... Um, you know, David had a, an adulterous affair. Uh, David murdered, a, murdered the, the uh, husband of the, of the woman that he's having an affair. I mean, David did horrible stuff, but yet, yet I think in, you see in David a repentant heart, whereas Saul was a defiant. He had a defiant heart. So let's begin reading in verse number 24. Uh, just, and you guys remember the story. He's supposed to kill all the Amalekites, and he's supposed to kill everything including the cattle, and he doesn't do that. And then when he's confronted by Samuel, he makes an excuse as to why he didn't do it. And, um, and this is what Samuel said to him in verse 22. Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Now, this is where there's this great now interaction. This is where we left off last week. And now we're going to enter this great interaction between Samuel and Saul. Now, listen to what happens in verse 24. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. And that's where I, I am sorry. I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandments of the Lord and your words. And then there's that word, because... Because I did it because of this. It's, it's the but word in a sense, you know, that I, I, I'm wrong, but. Okay? And that's really what he's saying here. I, I did it because I feared the people and obeyed, obeyed their voice. So here is kind of the first sign of repentance is, and we know that he's not repentant, is because he continues to shift the blame. He continues to shift the blame. This is the first uh, thing that he did. Uh, And this would be the first point in your notes, that he continued to shift the blame. He continued to say that I I didn't do it. This is what he, this is the mistake that he made before. This was the argument that he made before. Real repentance takes full responsibility. 
All right? So it's, we, we can all come up with reasons why we do the wrong thing. You know, well, I was, I was, <laughs> I hesitate to say this because I've been talking about it a lot. Somebody said to me last week, they came up and said, you obviously have a problem with speeding because you talk about it every service. <laughs> So I was going to go to the speedy illustration again, but I, I haven't. Honestly, I, I have not got a ticket in about 15 years. That does not mean that I have not sped. Um, but, the, but, you know, I did get pulled over recently with my son. Uh, uh, we live up north, and I was, I was in a hurry to get home. <laughs> I, there's no other way to say I, I really can't make excuses when I preach at this sermon, right? So, uh, <clears throat> and the officer walked up to my car, and he said, uh, did you, did you know you were doing in a, in a 35? And, uh, <laughs> and I was like, yes, sir. Yes, sir, I'm aware of that. And he goes, is, is there a reason? I said, there's no good one. <laughs> so, anyway, and, he, and so he says, well, I'd like your driver's license and registration, please. And I'm like, oh, man. So anyway, um, he came back up. He said, I'm just going to give you a warning today. I wanted to hug the guy, man. So anyway... <laughs> Because I had no, no good, I wasn't going to the hospital, I wasn't nothing, I wasn't, uh, and, but th- that's our human nature, right? We have all these reasons why. This is, and, and, but there, there comes a point where we just have to say, I did it, and I don't have anybody else to blame for it but me. That, that's a sign of real repentance, and, and Saul does not display that. Even after all of this that he's gone through, he still reacts negatively to uh, Samuel. He still reacts in a way where he's continuing to shift the blame. And it's so easy. We, we, we can blame our parents for the way that we are. And, and they do have a great influence on our lives. But ultimately, we must accept responsibility for ourselves. We must take responsibility for our lives. And this is a sign of repentance. I take responsibility for it. It's not my dad's fault. It's not my mom's fault. It's not my neighbor's fault. It's not my boss's fault. It's no, nobody's fault but mine. And, and Saul does not do that here. He continues to shift the blame. He, he basically said, I did it, but I was pressured. The second thing that happens is in verse 25. So he, he says, okay, I did it. I, I, I say I did it, but I, but I did it because I fear the people. Verse 25, now therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you, for you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. And as Samuel turned around to go away, Saul seized the edge of his robe, and it tore. So here we see the second sign of somebody who is not genuinely repentant. He was violent towards his accuser. He was violent towards his accuser. So what is he, he, he wants Saul, he wants Samuel to go back with him and to offer sacrifices in front of the people. And I'll talk more about why he wants that in a minute. He, he wants kind of public credibility is what he wants. He wants people to still think that Samuel's on his side because the people have great respect for Samuel. So when Samuel says, I'm not going to go back with you, he's going to take Samuel by force. And this is a sign a lot of times of people that are not repentant. Um, When I'm genuinely repentant, I will be angry at myself, not angry at others. This is what James said about repentance in James chapter 4. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. When I'm genuinely upset, when I'm genuinely repentant, I will turn inward, not outward, as far as emotion is concerned. Saul is frustrated with Samuel because he won't see it his way. He won't see it that, yes, I am sorry, but it's the people's fault. Samuel won't see it that way. So when he refuses to kind of do what Saul wants, he gets physical with him. He rips, he, he, he tries to pull him back to his direction to the point where he gets violent with his accuser. And he, he is basically going to physically force 
or intimidate someone into seeing it his way. And this is where I think a lot of domestic abuse comes from and domestic violence comes from. It's because we get, people get confronted with their sin and then they get angry at the accuser. No, your anger shouldn't be at that person that turned a light on you. Your anger should be at yourself. Your frustration should be turned inward, not ex- external, not outward, not angry at the people that are trying to help you. And this is a sign of repentance, or a lack of repentance, I should say, is violence towards their accuser, violence towards the person that has exposed them. And this is a mistake that he made. That We see the third thing in verse, if we read on down. It says, so after he tears his robe, verse 28, so Samuel said to, to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. Well, I bet he didn't like hearing that. I mean, you got to give it to Samuel. He's not afraid to speak the truth, right? Verse 29, also the strength of Israel will not lie, the strength of Israel will not lie nor relent, for he is not man that he should relent. Now, we know that God will change course or change direction based on the response of people. For example, this happened in Nineveh. I talked about that last week. God will, in a sense, say, I'm going to do this, but then we may respond in a, a particular way, uh, a, a repentant way, and then God will change his, his direction. But, but there does come a point where, where God says, this is the last straw. There's no, there's no changing you know, and this is why, why, why do we preach for you to repent of your sins? Um, today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Why do we preach that way? Because we genuinely believe that once death happens, there's no second chance. Once, once we pass from this life to the next, I can't undo in the next life what I've done in this life. So if I have rejected Jesus Christ in this life, then I have, I have forfeited my chance in the next. And nobody knows when they're going to die. We had, I, I went to a funeral this, week, this Friday of a lady that was in this service last week, 9.15, in this hour. Precious lady. She's in heaven with the Lord. 96 years old. She was in a wheelchair. She sat in the back. She was here last Sunday. She went home Sunday afternoon. Felt odd, pushed the button, the ambulance came. She went, to he- she went to heaven Monday morning. That'd be the way to go to me, right? You know, I mean, not a long, drawn-out thing. She was with the Lord in the morning. And I went to her funeral on Friday in the middle of nowhere, Kansas. Little, small country church. It was, I was blessed to be there. Um, but she is with the Lord. She And, and man, uh, many people spoke, the pastor spoke of her love for God and, and, of, her, and of her devotion to Jesus Christ. Um, she made the wise choice. That God is infinitely patient with us, is he not? He gives us chance after chance after chance after chance. He shows his grace to us. Um, he is calling us. He is pleading us to repentance. But there does come this point where once I've kind of crossed the line, I, there's no second chance. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. And that's the point he, that Samuel's making here. So verse 30 says, Then he said, Saul says, I have sinned, yet honor me now, please, before the elders of my people and before Israel, and return with me that I may worship the Lord your God. So Samuel turned back after Saul, and, and Saul worshiped the Lord. A lot of people talk here about what's, why did Samuel do it. I think, you know, I don't, I don't know if you've ever looked evil in the eye or you've ever, uh, you know, seen somebody that's done violent crime. Um, some, some commentators argue that he saw Saul for who he really was. And we know that Saul became an incredibly violent man. Um, I mean, he, he tried to kill David multiple occasions. He spent the rest of his life trying to kill David. We know that he tried to kill his own son, He's going to execute his own kid because he was a friend of David. Uh, we know that he also murdered a bunch of priests because they actually helped David out. He's this violent guy. So I think that what Saul 
Samuel is looking in the eyes of this man who's, this is, the, this is where he really turns. And he's like, okay, for the sake of the nation. Because can one man, can a guy that, that helped the nation become the guy that hurts the nation? Sure. And I think this is a situation where he sees, oh man, uh, Saul, who knows what's going to happen if I don't go back with him. So I think he relents here. He does, I think he does it for the sake of the country. He turned back and, and, and went and worshiped with the Lord. But this, the bigger thing that I wanted to show you today was, this kind of shows us another sign of a lack of repentance. Number three, he was more concerned about his reputation with the people than his character before God. How do we know he wasn't repentant? Because he, was, he wanted the people to think that, look, me and Samuel and God are still good. One of the signs of a lack of repentance is that we become obsessed with damage control. And what I mean by that is, we want to know who knows and what will people think of me now. We become obsessed with this. So, man, I don't want to, I don't want to spill my dirty laundry because then people will think less of me. That's, that's really what Saul's doing here. He's kind of like, I, I need... Uh, I need you to go back with me, Samuel, because the people will think that we're still on good terms. That the, 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 my reputation will still be intact because Samuel's still with me. The reality is, is if I'm genuinely repentant, I don't really care who knows. I just want to be right with God. Can I just, can I just tell you all something that I'm not, look, everybody's like, hey, what's he going to say? <laughs> I, look, all of us, everybody in your life is going to disappoint you at one point or another. The, 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 the greatest mistake we make in life is we put people too high on the chain. There's like God and then there's people. Now, that should be flipped. Everybody in this room is human. Everybody's has got issues. So when you hear that somebody's got issues, you shouldn't be like, I can't believe it. They have issues. They're a sinner. They sinned. I, I think it's, it's a mistake to make people idols. It's a mistake to have idols, even if those idols are people. Because they will let you down. But I think what we do is we, we have an image that we want to portray. And so we work hard to maintain that image. And man, it's, it, the truth is, is that what's in the dark will come out in the light. So what he's doing here is, is he is participating in the act of worship, but he is not worshiping. Genuine worship is something that begins on the inside and affects the outside. Real repentance doesn't care who knows. They just want to be right. They just want to be right with God. Y'all with me this morning? So, don't get all hung up on your reputation and what people think of you. Get, get, if you're going to get hung up on something, get hung up on being right with God. Getting things right with God. Getting things right with people. And Saul does not do that. He's more concerned about what people think of him than what God thinks of him. So what else? So this is where it gets rough, okay? Then Samuel said, bring Agag, king of the Amalekites. Now who's Agag? Agag was the king of the Amalekites, Amalekites and, and he was not supposed to be here. So... Then Samuel said, bring Agag, king of the Amalekites, here. So Agag came to him cautiously, and Agag said, surely the bitterness of death is past. In other words, surely I have made it. Okay, I know that everybody in my family, everybody's died, but surely I'm going to live now because of the fact that um, he's not going to do anything here publicly. Well, Saul doesn't do anything, but Samuel does in verse 32. But Samuel said, as your sword has made women childless, 
So shall your mother be childless among women. And Samuel hacked Agag in pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. Okay. A little intense. But this leads us to our fourth point. How do we know that Saul was not repentant? He was unwilling to make things right. He was unwilling to make things right. Who, who really should have done this instead of Samuel? Oh, right? Isn't he the one that was supposed to do it? This, to me, I think is the greatest proof that he is unrepentant. Because when you are genuinely repentant, repentance means doing a 180. It means completely turning around. And it means I will do whatever I have to do to make the, the wrong right. Okay, there's a, there's a guy in the Bible that we used, when I was a kid, we used to sing a song back. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. It's a terrible song. <laughs> and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior passed that way, and then I don't know what else it happens now. <laughs> he looked up in the tree and he said, Zacchaeus, you come down for I'm going to your house today. For I'm going to you guys remember that song? If you went to Sunday school or you know that song, okay. That is based on the Bible. Luke 19, 8. Then Zacchaeus st uh, stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation. Now, what was Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus was a tax collector. He, he took advantage of people in his position. So he says, If I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I will restore it fourfold. So if I stole one thing from you, I will give you back four of, what, of the one that I stole you. So if I stole $10 from you, I'll give you back 40 Because I want to make it right. See, a lot of times, this is, where it, this is where a lot of people get hung up because it's like, okay, I'm sorry, but I don't want to make the wrong right. I'm just like, I'm, I said I'm sorry, you're supposed to deal with it now. No, if you're genuinely repentant, you'll be like, I'll do whatever I got to do to make it right. I'll, 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 I'll pay whatever I got to pay. I'll do whatever I got to do because I want to make it right with you. But a lot of times when we're in the wrong, we're trying to set the rules. And this is, this is a terrible mistake to me. This is what shows we're not genuinely repentant. Well, you understand how much it's going to cost me if I make it right? Yeah. Yeah but you have to be willing to pay it. He's unwilling to pay it. He's unwilling to go back and undo the wrong. But, you know, I know I ripped the government off and I shouldn't have. Well, then you need to pay it back. If you stole from someone, you need to pay them back. Not just, I'm sorry, please forgive me. We good now, right? <laughs> Years ago, I had a paper out, and I had a little truck. My dad gave it to me. It was, in four, it was a Chevy S10, little little pickup. And I, I actually loved that little truck. And I threw papers in that little truck. And I used to deliver these apartments off of 21st Street, um, Whispering Pines, I think, apartments. Well... One night, man, I, uh, I, I used to leave my keys in the car. You guys know where this story's going, don't you? Huh? <laughs> well, I'm, I delivered a four apartment, so I'd park the car, get out of the car, take the, the uh, papers into the apartments, deliver them, leave the keys in the ignition, come back, did it for years and years, never had an issue. So one day, there was a kid who went to church here, actually, and I knew he lived in one of those apartments, and, and actually in the apartment I was delivering in, and so I, I come out the back side of the door, and everybody in the room knows what your car sounds like when it fires up. So my car, I heard my truck fire up. I'm like, hmm, that sounds like my truck. So I, I, I ran around the corner, and sure enough, I, I see it pulling away. And I'm like, ah, oh, that's got to be Brandon, man. He's just messing with me. <laughs> so I start running as fast as I could. 
The kid pulled out on, I don't know the name of the street, pulled out on the street, and he's obviously never driven a stick shift before because he couldn't get it out of first gear and was just... (laughs) So at the time, apparently, I could run at least 10 miles an hour. (laughs) And I'm just running beside him, and I'm just screaming, and and I'm, hey, hey, hey. And I look at the, and I'm like, that's not branded. And the kid pulls, he ends up figuring out how to get it out of first, and he pulls to these other apartments that are just diagonal from Whispering Pines, and he backs the thing in, and I run all the way over there, and he's back in the car in. Now, hindsight, what I should have done was, is I should have just let the kid, I had a spare key, I should have let the kid park the car, go inside, and then steal my car back, steal my truck back. (laughs) But I didn't do that. The adrenaline's flowing. I reach over there and just open the door up. He's, dry, he's in the driver's seat. I just open the door up. I'm like, hey, get out of my truck. And he looks at me. And uh, then I'm like, what am I doing? I could get shot. <laughs> you know, I know, long story, this kid took my truck. He ends up doing all kinds of damage to it. And um, I never saw that red truck again. I mean, I, I ended up getting it back, but it was completely trash. And I'll never forget the kid... He's laying on the ground, and the cop comes over, and he says he would like to talk to you. So I walked over there, and he's like, hey, man, I'm sorry for messing up your truck. And I just remember going, well, being sorry, don't fix this truck. I remember that's what I said. And he's like, I'll fix it, man. I'll, 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 I'll pay to get it fixed. He never paid to get it fixed. He actually sat in jail for a year. He got out. One of his things was he's supposed to pay me back. Never, never seen it. So I tell you that story to just say, I don't believe the kid. I don't believe he was sorry. I think he's sorry he got caught. But if you're really sorry you messed up my truck, then you're going to pay to repair my truck. I don't have the money right. Well, then you do whatever you got to do. Who have you wronged? What do you got to do to make it right? See, this is the whole, not, you don't do this out of, um, look, I don't serve the Lord out of fear, or I don't serve the Lord out of obligation. But I tell you this, when I really understand how, how magnificently terrible my sins are and what Jesus did for me, if I worked for Jesus for the rest of my life and never got a dime, it'd be a good deal. Jesus did a beautiful thing when making me right with God and then called me into the ministry and then I get to preach the gospel and get paid for it. How unfair is that? But there should be something inside of me. It's like, I'll work for you for the, every day for the rest of my life. and It'd be a good deal because I, I could never, and the reality is, this is the truth, I could never repay God for all he's done for me. But I'll tell you this, you can try to repay the people down here that you've wronged because that shows genuine repentance. But we, do, we just want to throw words around like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, you know. And then everything's supposed to be good. And prove to people through your actions that you'll do whatever you got to do to make it right. Saul didn't want to do that. He didn't want to do that. Why? Because that's hard. That's the hard stuff. Then the final thing is found at the end of the verse. So this is really sad, 34 and 35. Then Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house at Gibeah of Saul. And Samuel went no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Isn't that sad? Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul, and the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. Number five, He lost his relationship with Samuel. How do we know that he was unrepentant? He lost his relationship with Samuel. Y'all ever heard this term before? Birds of a feather. Yeah, you guys heard it, right? Repentant people tend to hang around with repentant people. What I mean by that is we tend to hang around people similar to us. So a lot of times, man, I just kind of, if I'm doing a self-evaluation of my life, it's good for me to step back and say, who are my, who are my best friends? 
Okay, who who are who are the people that um, that I I really am linked with that I'm close to? And that that gives a pretty good indicator of kind of where I am at. Here, Saul and Samuel they're just on they're just on different levels now. I mean. Saul goes down an incredibly dark path, which we're going to spend the rest of this chapter, the rest of this book looking at. And then God raises up a King David, and Samuel now kind of devotes more time with David and energy towards David because they just are going separately in their relationship. And, th- and this, is, this is repentant people. Um, they draw close to repentant people. People that are proud and stubborn tend to separate from these kind. He lost his relationship with Samuel. Have you blown it? Have you made a mistake? Um, how are you going to make it right? Well, you start with repentance. And repentance means that I don't pass the blame. I accept. The buck stops here. Didn't one of our presidents have that on his desk? The buck stops here. So I, I got to put that kind of on my, the buck stops here. I accept responsibility for my sin. If I'm repentant, I will not be violent towards, in any way, towards my accuser. So uh, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, punch you, I'm not going to hurt you, I'm not going to be violent towards you, I'm not going to physically run you down to others. You know, you can, you can assassinate somebody's character with your words. I'm not going to do that uh, if I'm genuinely repentant. I'm, I'm going to turn, it, turn my anger not outward but inward. I'm going to weep and mourn and ask for God to change me. If I'm genuinely repentant, I will care more about my character before God than my reputation with people. Like, I'm really disturbed. There's a, there's a lot of guys who have, um, in ministry, who, who, who have made horrific uh, mistakes, and yet and they rush back into the pulpit. And I think it just shows that they're, 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 they crave the attention, they crave the position, more than they crave being right with God. Do you care more about what uh, your reputation, your status, who you are, than, than uh, how, how your standing is before God? Because that's ultimately all that really matters, right? How do I know if I'm repentant? I'm, I'm willing to do whatever it takes to make it right. Whatever it takes. No mountain too high that I will not climb to make it right. I'll give back to the, I'll give back fourfold what I've done. And then a sign of repentance is, is that I get I, I tend to be close with repentant people. With people who we are of like mind. We are of like spirit. Um, I pray that we'll not just be sorry, that we'll, we'll be repentant. That we'll really be different. Okay? All right, let's go to the Lord. Thank you again for listening to our series on First Samuel with Pastor Mark Doss. If you have questions about today's message, please contact our church office at info at TopekaBaptist.org. Give us a call at 785-862-0988 or check us out online at www.topekabaptist.org. 